So this is the second week in our series, Cross Reference, where we're cross-referencing our faith and our finances. Basically, what you're supposed to do with every area of your life is to say, how is my life changing in this area because of my relationship with Jesus? And finances are one of the most crucial, important, central parts of our lives. Think about the every. Think about how many decisions you make that are involving your finances, whether it's where you live, the lifestyle that you're living. It's not just about how you give to a church, but finances uh, is a huge uh, cause for, for a relational and marital strife over and over again. So the reason that we talk about finances is because, number one, Jesus talked about it, and we like that guy a lot. Uh, and so we're going to talk about what he said a lot. But the other reason is because we don't want there to be this huge part of your area where we never actually talk about how the gospel should make an impact. And so last week, I asked you this main question, how has my relationship with money changed because of my relationship with Jesus? How has my relationship with money changed because of my relationship with Jesus? And I I don't know a better way for us to start. It's not about not asking the question, do you give? How much do you give? Can you give more? Because if the church is only interested in what you are, what you can give or what you are giving, we're actually missing our ability, missing our opportunity, missing our responsibility to get you to love Jesus more, not just to be able to change and modify one or two little behaviors. So we want to always be asking this question, how has my relationship with money changed because of my relationship with Jesus? And the story I'm going to read to you is actually Jesus showing how someone's relationship with money changed in how they decided to use it. It's called the parable of the shrewd manager. This is in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Again, the book of Luke is a New Testament uh, book, a gospel, a telling of the, the life of Jesus on earth, written by a guy named Luke. Luke. There you go. You know, <laughs> if it, Always, always a good chance if, if whatever the guy's name is, that's the person who wrote it. So the book of Luke starting in verse, uh, chapter 16, starting in verse 1. So Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came to that manager that he was wasting his employers, came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what is this I hear about you? Go get your report in order because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, well, now what? But my boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I am too proud to beg. <laughs> so the guy's like, look, I have standards. He's like, you know, like in Christmas vacation where Cousin Eddie's like holding out for management, you know, and it's like, just, just take whatever job you have available. So I'm, I'm, too, I'm too proud to beg. And he goes, ah, I know how to ensure I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? Not how much do you owe me, how much do you owe him? He said, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. This is a weird story for Jesus to be telling. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is Jesus' story. And he goes to the next guy. He goes, how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. But by the way, I hope he didn't hear how the oil guy got 50% off. You know what I'm saying? This guy got a 20% discount. The oil guy got a 50% discount. It's like the oil guy must have been like, maybe, maybe, maybe the shrewd manager just really likes uh, Greek, Greek salad and wanted to be able to make sure he had his olive oil for his dressing. Come on, guys. There's enough people from Tarpon Springs around here to get that joke. You know what I'm saying? So the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of the world are more shrewd in their dealings with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal 
home. I would just like to take a moment to thank Jesus and Luke for doing all of the work this morning. You're like, mm. so you're like reading a passage. You're like, what should? What do you think the lesson is out of this passage? What do you? What should be the main emphasis out of this passage? Well, here is the lesson. Verse nine starts. <laughs> Use worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. Use your worldly possessions to benefit others and make friends. To benefit others and make friends. Friends, that's kind of a strange thing for us to be able to, I think, say and ask at times. Like, use my worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. You're like, oh, people like me because I do stuff for them? Uh, have you ever had somebody do something for you and buy you a gift? And were you like, ugh? <laughs> You're like, oh, thank you. I, that's so nice. You know, like... Is, this, is it my birthday? Did I forget? Like, no, I just wanted to be nice. <gasps> just to be nice. Like, you could just like, get somebody like a candy bar. Like, it doesn't even have to be like something good. It could just be like, you know, like, and it was your leftover, but they don't know that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I brought you fries home. You're like, oh, that's so nice. I mean, it was like the ones left on my plate and I boxed it up. And it's like, but I was thinking of you, you know, and I brought you them this. To be able to get a gift, it does. It changes people's hearts. It opens them up. And Jesus is saying, this guy was going to lose his job and he was thinking more about, hey, this is just some worldly resources. Let me use them to be able to actually create better relationships and to bless people around us. So that's the question we're going to ask. Are we, are you, last week your question was, how has my relationship with money changed because my relationship with Jesus? Here's your question today. Are you using your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends? Are you using your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends? And the question might be like, uh, no, because I don't have enough. We're going to get to that in a little bit because the real way to do it is not to have a lot and then to use that, but to be faithful with what you have. Be faithful with what you have. And you're like, I would be, but I like my things better than I like giving things to other people. Which is why the real, so, so the question is, do I use my worldly resources to benefit others? Well, I don't know, maybe. How do I do that better? Be faithful with what you are already have. Well, how do I be faithful with what I already have? Change the things that you love to love Jesus more than your stuff. Right. Learn how to love Jesus more than you love your stuff, and you love your possessions. Examine your loves. But that's why the starting point is, does anybody, anybody have a pool? Anybody ever at, at like a swimming pool in their backyard? No? This is, well, we got to get some other people. I need to be able to go to your house. <laughs> My parents do, and growing up, we always would get like the, we get the, like the little chemical test. Has anybody ever taken your own like pH balance, you know, and like you pour the, you get the little litmus test, and you put it in there, and you, you get these pieces of paper, and you pick up like, you get the chlorine water, and you put the little trip, 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 and you shake it. You know, it's like if you're, if, you're a, if you're a millennial, you grew up on Bill Nye the Science Guy. But if you're Gen X, you grew up on Mr. Wizard, okay? And like I'd just be out Mr. Wizarding that thing right there and be like, okay, I can see what's going on inside the pool by taking this little test. And so this question of am I, am I using my worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends is like taking a little bit of pool water out of your heart, putting a little bit of chemicals in there, shaking up and going, what's really inside of there? This litmus test to see what's really going on inside here. I can pretty much get an observation by what's happening out here. So why would you not? Well, here's why I don't. I, I'm working on it. I would struggle with a lack mentality. That's, my, that's where I would struggle with it. Why am I hesitant to use my worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends? Because I can get afraid that I am not going to have enough. And that is silly. I know. God had never sets a dollar amount and never sets a skill amount as a minimum to bless others and to make an impact. But that's where I fight. Now, maybe your fighting is like, no, I know I have enough, but I like what it brings me. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you struggle to think, oh, I don't have enough. 
So there's nothing I have, I don't have enough to actually benefit others. And I don't have enough to be able to love my family and to make friends with others. So whatever your struggle might be, maybe it's, oh no, I, I have a lot. Or maybe it's, oh, I don't ever, I'm never gonna have enough. And think about when you were like a teenager or like just in your 20s and you're like, man, if I could make like $20,000 a year, like there's just so much left over, you know, like... I'll be able, because you're not thinking about like, well, I don't have to pay rent, and you don't know what car insurance is at that point, and, and you, do, you just think food is like, man, they've got that dollar menu, you know? I mean, like, I could just be crushing that at all times, and, and think about it. If you don't think you're ever going to think about you have enough, think about how much money you have continued to make in your life, and at no point in time did you go, I did it! I got to the amount where I will now be able to use everything over and above this to be able to benefit and bless others. Because as the great theologian Biggie Smalls told us, the more money you have, the more problems. As soon as you get a raise, the refrigerator breaks. As soon as you get a bonus, braces. You know, like as soon as, as soon, I'm like, we're, we're, like, we're just about to get out of braces. And then Kelly's like, you know, we need to prepare for college. And I was like, we almost got that money back. Nope, call up the college fund. So, so it's real easy for me to go, oh, they see there's not enough. And that's what I, instead of thinking, wait, what do I actually have? And let me use that. I think, well, the little bit of leftover that I have, which is not a little bit of leftover, but I, my, my mentality shrinks it. My mentality reduces it rather than saying, let me just be faithful with what I have and let's see what God might do with it. See, after Jesus said, here's the lesson, he continues with, if you're faithful with little things, you'll be faithful with the large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you will not be honest with great responsibility. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? See, if you are waiting for God to, you're like, I will start harvesting as soon as God gives me seed to sow. You're not realizing that you already have them in your hands. And I know so many people who wait for a harvest from seeds they've never planted. You cannot expect to pick fruit from trees you have never planted. You cannot pick flowers from a garden you never planted. And if you are waiting, you're like, oh man, my car is so crappy. I don't vacuum it. I don't take care of it. I get the oil changed every like like 30,000 miles and say like, which don't, don't do that by the way. You know, like it's all confusing. Used to be everybody was like 3,000 miles and then it was like, well, it's really 5,000. Then there's like synthetic blend. They're like, it's gonna be $9,000 to change the oil in your car, but you won't have to do it until 2097. You're like, okay, I don't, is that a good deal? That when I get a nice car, I'll vacuum it. When I get a nice house, I'll take care of it and maintain it. And you're waiting for the nice thing to start being faithful. And what Jesus is saying here is if why would any, if you're not trustworthy about worldly wealth, who would trust you with anything else? If you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? If you're dishonest with little things, if you're not faithful with little things, why do you think that you would show the faithfulness to be trusted with great things? So how do you use your worldly wealth to be able to benefit others and make friends? You've got to start by being faithful. Using it well shows that you can be trusted. That You can be trusted with whatever you have. You can be trusted with more. This is why any real good series that a church preaches about money cannot ever be solely about the 10% that you should be giving. It should always be about 100%. And not 100% just of your wallet, but 100% of your heart and soul and motivations. And whatever's happening in your heart and your soul is going to be worked out in your hands and your words. So if we just white knuckle, just white knuckle and just, oh, just put that credit card through the slot. Okay, got it. But your heart hates that you're doing it the whole time. You will eventually stop being faithful because it was not about faithfulness. It was about performance. So I don't want you to perform differently. 
I don't want you to just add a zero on a check just because it's like, oh, maybe this will make God happy. I want you to actually know what makes God happy. I want you to worship him and love him and be filled with his spirit and to be in love with him, to, to be filled with his word, not to be able to white knuckle some behavior so maybe you'll gain God's approval, but to actually know that God's approval comes from his love for you. That's why the church, the church, you know, people are always like, the church, the church, like, let me tell you, tell you something. As, as an official representative of the church, the church does not exist. There's individuals, there's peoples, there's organizations, but there is not the church. Because people are like, the church hurt me. I'm like, nobody in China has ever hurt you with what they have done. No, 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 no believer in the United Arab Emirates has made an impact on your faith, okay? Like, trust me, they have not damaged you. So when you say the church is only interested in my giving, no, they're not. But anyways, let's just go with that stereotype. The church is only interested in giving, fine, they're not. But do you, they're, they should be interested just with Jesus is your whole life. So we're not asking the question, are you giving or are you not giving? It's who does your life belong to? Who does your heart belong to? Who does your 10%, your 20, 30, 40, 110%? Who does your getting up? Who does your going to bed? Who does your sleep? Who does your time? Who does your relationship? Who does that belong to? Because you do not just honor God when you give to a 501c3. That is not the only time you can honor God. You honor God when you spend less than what you bring in. You you honor God when you use your money when it doesn't use you. You honor God when you think of others and when you bless others, when you don't operate out of fear so you only save everything and you don't operate out of foolishness so you always spend everything expecting God to be the one to have to bail you out, but you live a life of faithfulness like he's calling us to because I know he's my provider and I know he's called me to be wise in the way that I've used my finances. Yeah. Because if you think that he's, if you only want to talk about, you know, like he's, he's Jehovah Jireh, which I believe we're talking about next week, we're singing next week, good, because it's part of my message. Uh, you know, like there's a new song, not the Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the Lord is sufficient for me. Hey, I feel like that's like, like, <laughs> we were 2.5 seconds from David busting out a tambourine right there, so we, we. <laughs> right. When we talk about God being a provider, we don't. We don't use that like a credit card in an 80s movie where you never any, like how much room service did Kevin McAllister really run up in Home Alone 2? Like, I mean, it's like $1,000 and that's gotta be like about $2,500 to $3,000. And we, we never see it being paid. So if you think about God as a provider and so you just live foolishly, that's not showing love and real trust. That's showing an abusive relationship with God. Because you think, oh, well, I don't have to be responsible. He's going to be responsible for me. But if you really loved him, you'd be eager to be responsible because you know how valuable what he's given you really is. Are you trying to build a blessing? Or are you trying to build a bubble with the way that you use your worldly possessions and resources? Are you trying to actually find ways and find rhythms to build a blessing or are you trying to build this safe bubble around you? No, and you might look at this and go, no, I want to. But I've got to get my savings up. Just like Jesus told us to get our $1,000 emergency fund. That's not Jesus, that's Dave Ramsey. <laughs> they are not the same. Well, I've got to get all of my retirement in order. I've got to get, make sure all of my insurances are at all the absolute peak. I've got to, oh, you just reminded me about the braces payment. Actually, you also reminded me, I've got to get the college fund. We've got to get all the, and once everything is done, now I can be faithful. Because it, if you think it takes a certain amount to be faithful, instead of saying, what's in your hand right now? What, what, what could you do for somebody right now? Find a way to bless them without having to say, hey, if I give this to the church so that I can get tax deductible credit and be honest, most of you take the general deduction anyways. Can we get this money to this person? No, just go give the money to the person. Just go do it. Find a way. I was trying to get uh, some, we've been doing some work in our kitchen and, and I was trying to get some um, looking at some different glasses, and I was like, well, we don't really need, there's only three of us, we don't really need all these things, and I was like, oh, man, I found this with these ones that were really pretty, and I really liked, and, and, uh, and I was like, oh, but you have to order them in a set of 12, and I only need two, and I was like, oh, I guess I can't get it, and I was like, oh, hey, dummy, so I ordered all of them, and then just was like, oh, I'll just give them as gifts, like, it's not a big thing, it was not a, it was not a big thing, it was not an expensive thing, it was not an expensive gift, and I didn't, I actually thought it was like, oh, that's just so much. It wasn't. 
It wasn't so much. And I just was like, I forget that I am missing a chance just to be nice and love others. Let me just be faithful what I have, with what I have. Let me not wait for the grand thing. Let me not wait. You don't have to be like, well, I just can't take my friends on vacation with me. You don't have to. You don't have to take them to Ruth's Chris and be like, I can't bless my friends until I got to take them to the, to the Burns dessert room. No, you can't. Like, you can do that beforehand, all right? And you want, Taco Bell is wonderful, okay? And if, if you ever want to take me or Chris through Taco Bell, we'll be very happy about it, okay? <laughs> Statistics show it's one of the healthiest fast food joints. Don't, don't give me, I mean, I, I know the Lord's Chicken, but the Lord's Chicken is not open on Sundays, okay? Like... <laughs> Why can't we get any Seventh-day Adventists to work at Chick-fil-A on Sunday? Like, I don't understand. Like, let's just make a partnership. Let's just... <laughs> it, can you just be faithful with what you have right now? You're like, I, it's hard. There's probably some reason that you are pushing back of like, again, I don't have enough. You don't understand. I don't have enough. It's not, nothing I could do is of significant impact. No, 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 just be faithful. How do you actually live like that, though? How do you actually do that? Before you hit the retirement goals, before you get all the square feet squeezed out, how do you do that? You've got to examine what you love. You've got to examine your heart. What is it? What does it crave? What challenges it? I was... It, we don't normally get a lot of people complaining about that we preach on money like once a year, but I'm always like interested when people complain, if we, if we talk about money, again, less than Jesus talked about money, what does that say about your relationship with money? Are you uncomfortable? Like, I'm always uncomfortable. Why? I, like, I wonder if that starts to prick your heart. Again, shows a little bit there that maybe there's something there where I never can trust. I never have enough. I'm always afraid. There's always fear. And that has nothing to do with your 10% or your 100%. That has everything to do with your trust and love in Jesus, where we are always trying to get you to point back to. See, after the faithfulness, Jesus says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. He never says this about anything else. It is true. You cannot serve both God and man. You cannot serve both God and the king. You cannot serve both God and lust. You cannot serve both God and anger. You cannot serve both God and ego. You cannot. But the only thing that Jesus is so explicit about is money. For you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. It is the only thing that he says that about. That's significant. We, we got to pay attention to that. And he continues in verse 14 to say the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, again, depending upon, I, I don't know what your biblical background is, but the Pharisees were basically the dominant religious Jewish sect of the day. They were the religious authority. They, they were them. If there was like, who's in charge right now? Who's running the synagogue? It was the Pharisees. So anytime you see the Pharisees, you always need to think about the dominant religious group of the era. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money. The Christians, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, the small group leaders who dearly loved their money heard all of this and repented. Oh no, they didn't. They scoffed at him. You're talking about this too much. Stick to Jesus. Stick to, stick to religion, stick to the law, stop talking about money. This is not your area. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What the world honors is detestable in the sight of God. You know, it's not that the religious people were loving money and it's like that was unique to them as so, as so like only religious people were loving money. And so this is a unique challenge. It's not. It's just that I think we know there's this inherent distrust and disconnect when we see religious people who love God and are trying to love money at the same time, particularly religious professionals, right? When you see religious professionals, isn't that why that there's this, isn't that why preachers and sneakers exploded as an Instagram account and why there was so much controversy over it over and over again? Because it doesn't matter if it is a gift or not, that to be able to see a pastor or a preacher up there wearing $3,000 shoes or a $2,000 Gucci belt, people will go, there's something that doesn't sit right with that. 
Because you're supposed to love Jesus more than you love anything else. It's true. Now, I'm not about getting to the economics of sneakerheads and all that kind of stuff, but let me ask you this question. Is that a challenge to those who are uniquely religious professionals? Or is it to those who say that they love Jesus more than they love anything else? Would we look at, do you have a different standard for me because I'm a pastor in how I use and love money than you have for yourself in the way that you love and that you use money if you're a Christian? And is that the case? Should that be? Or should we as Christians not put a different thing on the priest or the pastor but to say for all of us is my heart and love about Jesus and Jesus alone. Is my heart for Jesus and Jesus alone. Because it's not about the use of money, it's about the love of money and the things that the love produces. Money is not the root of all evil, if you have heard that. Money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. It is the craving, it is the desiring that is the root of all evil. It is the, I just need a little bit more. At what cost? At what cost? You got a little bit more and you spent a little less time with your family. You got a little bit more, your house got a little bit bigger, you spent less and less time inside of it. You spent more and more time on that car and then all you did was park it in the driveway and then never drive it. You went on the vacations and then you complained how exhausted you were when you got home because you were trying to stop everything on the outside from spinning and you never actually dealt with the thing inside of you that was spinning out of control which was a love for something other than Jesus. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. People who long to be rich fall into a temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. If money was a bad thing, the easy way to do it would be to get rid of money, to sell all our possessions, put it in a communal pot, and I don't know, put out a tent, or I don't even know how you do it. I don't even know how you would live in a, I mean, religious people have, have fought over the years to be able to try to live in a completely, like, aestheticless life to be able to, to push back against money, but that doesn't deal with your heart. You know, it doesn't deal with my heart to be able to mow my lawn of weeds. It doesn't deal with the fact that the weeds are there. They just start looking like all, they're all the rest of the height with the same, they're the same height as the rest of the grass, okay? So it doesn't actually get the weeds out. It just makes me not think about them and make me not realize that I've got this fight and this desire inside of my heart because this doesn't actually say that those who are rich, it says the people who long to be rich, Man, if I have, you know, like, I don't know anything, to, for whatever fault, I don't have, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency other than I know how to say that word. I know what Bitcoin is. I know what Dogecoin is that I kept thinking everybody was misspelling it as Dogecoin. It's not, it's Dogecoin. And people are like, this is it. This is the gold rush. This is the landmine. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with making wealth or any of those kind of things. But man, I don't want to crave that. I don't want to spend all my time chasing that. I don't want to be so hungry for it that I actually starve myself of the things of God because I'm so hungry for possessions, for satisfaction, for comfort, and, and for the things that the world is telling me are actually going to make my life better. Use godly resources for godly purposes. Luke 16, 9 says this. Here's the lesson. Use worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. How do you use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends? faithful with whatever you have. And if you are struggling to be faithful with what you have, perhaps that is pointing at something deeper in your heart. And what you actually need to deal with is not what your accounts look like, but what your heart and trust looks like. That's the first question. 
We need to get our hearts to the place to say that God doesn't love us when we give. He loves us and has already given the most to us. And so as we pray to close this message, that's, so that's the way I'll ask the questions in the reverse order right there. Do you love God more than you love anything? Have you been living in that way? And if, if not, let me pray for you right now. Let's join together. Let's believe with God that this moment can be a moment where those loves change. The behavior is gonna take the rest of your life to change. But the heart, the desire, the love can change in a moment. And then my second question is, if you know that your heart and your life and your love belong to Jesus, are you using your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends? And if not, why not? Because here is the lesson. Let's pray and respond to Jesus. Father, thank you so much for your challenge. Father, I don't want to stay more where I am. I want to be more like you. I don't want to stay in my struggles. I don't want to stay in my lack mentality. I don't want to stay there, God. I want to be more like you. And Father, for those who are saying, well, I can't get there till I love God more than I love money or love anything else. And that's what I want to do. I want to declare my love for Jesus more than anything else. If that's you, pray with me at home in your seat. Say, Jesus, I am fully yours. Would you forgive my past? As I turn from it, turn from those old loves and turn to a new love in you. And Father, I pray for those of us who know our hearts belong to you, God. Would you show us? Are we using our worldly resources to benefit others and make friends? Let us be faithful with whatever we have to bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.